going to do this. But I do have the question. Um, when I say worship, or if somebody says, let's, uh, you know, I worship God, or let's go to worship. I've heard people say that before. Um, or I enjoy worshiping God. What, <laughs> what comes to mind? Like, what do you, what do you see in your, in your mind there? What, just name a few things. What, what is associated with that? Yeah. Praying. Okay, that's a good one. Yeah. Sermons. Wow, those are good. Yeah, what else? What else comes to mind? What's that? Singing. Singing. Great. Anything else that you guys instantly think of? Uh, it, and it doesn't necessarily even have to be in this context. Just the word worship uh, may bring other ideas to mind. People bowing down before an idol. Yeah. People bowing down before an idol. Um, that is not quite so much in our culture, and yet... Um, And yet, uh, certainly, if you're bowing down to something and worshiping something, we would, we would acknowledge that as worship. Yeah. Reading the Bible can be worship. That's right. So all of these things, uh, and it could be. It could be a secular idea of worship. It could be a Christian idea of worship. Uh, there are a lot of ideas we may think of uh, that come to mind. I, I think of temple, think Old Testament temple things sometimes, sacrificing, uh, burnt offerings, um, you know, all of those type of things are, are, are worship, acts of worship that I'm going to call it tonight. And Scripture has a lot to say and demonstrate about what worship is. And a simple biblical definition, um, there's, there's some long ones I love to parse apart. Um, but a simple one is just a, a wor that worship is honor and adoration directed toward God. Worship simply in the Bible is just is honor and adoration directed toward God. And that could happen in a lot of things, right? Um, so, but one thing that is important to remember is that with regard to God's people, regard to Christians, worship is central to the Christian life. It's not like a thing that a Christian does. Um, it's not just things that God's people do. It's actually uh, central. MacArthur actually says, worship is to the Christian what an engine is to a car. It is the very core, the most essential element. And so something like that is probably something we should study. I know that we do it a lot, and we, and, and we might even talk about it a lot, but studying it from God's Word does a couple of things. First of all, it, it encourages me. It reminds me about what, what is central to being God's people. It also corrects wrong thinking that my brain might introduce. My brain is sick and deceitful. I was born that way, and He's been redeeming my thinking He's been showing me truth in His Word. And so if we want to worship God correctly, uh, we have to look at His Word to see how we should be worshiping Him. Particularly if the definition is to bring honor to God. How do you know what's going to honor God unless you know God and how He has revealed Himself in His Word, right? So tonight, looking at worship, um, I, 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 want to, um, I want to encourage us to think big picture. Um, it is central to the Christian life. It is actually the very reason God saves us. The reason God saves sinners is because people were originally created to be His worshipers and are separated from Him until He redeems them. And to, to save people means He is taking sinners and making them worshipers, not of themselves, which is what we're born doing, not of worldly things and pursuits, which is what we're born wanting, but to change us from sinners into worshipers of himself. That is the whole purpose of his salvation, that he would get glory, right? And we get something very good for us. And um, that is, that is uh, definitely exciting in, in the gospel. So last week, Josh Kelso came and taught on Romans 12, which is great. because Now I don't have to, because that is a key verse. And if you remember, uh, last week he said, hey, uh, from Romans 12.1, Actually, let's let's. Uh, I'm going to read that real quick. Is that is that on one of the slides? That's okay. That's 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 fine. I'm going to actually look it up here. Romans 12. I mean, I'm going to quote it, but uh, given how many different translations we may have here, I just want to make sure that I'm being accurate too. Um, this is foundational, and it was, it was. I'm so thankful that Josh went through this. But it says, "Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in the uh, by the mercies of God." Okay, remember what he said? Here's Paul 
just gushing and, and teaching and just exhorting people about how, about how the gospel works. He's going all into what the gospel is. The mercies of God being seen through the gospel, right? We were created by God, bearing His image to know God, can, meant to be connected to Him, be worshipers of Him, but because of our race's sinfulness, we're all separated from Him spiritually. This is what Paul's been saying. Um, our natural disposition toward our holy God is, was, was now after the fall to reject Him and to rebel against Him. But while we were yet sinners, Christ, Christ died. And so if you remember what he was talking about, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing again, but in light of the gospel, therefore, in the mer- by the mercies, these mercies of God, in light of all that, Paul urges, exhorts, pleads with us all to present all of who we are to God as a living sacrifice. And what does he call that? If you're looking at Romans 12, 1, 2, and 3, what, what, what does Romans 1 call presenting your whole selves, your bodies, as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God? You guys remember? It's the very next part of the verse if you're looking at it. Anybody have Romans 12, 1? What's that? Spiritual service of worship. So here is the the beginning of us understanding what worship is. And Josh went through it last week. And he gave us um, three response. He gave us the right response to the gospel. The right response. The only reasonable response to that epic of a message and a a redemption. And the very first thing that he points out is a sacrificial life of worship. And tonight, I just want to dig into that. Do we really know what that means? Um, Are we... we (laughs) waking up every day, being exhorted in that right there. And and the rest of this is a continuation of that worship, of a whole life kind of worship. So that's where we're going to go tonight. Um, You know, why do we worship God? Just as a summary, well, number one, He deserves it. Uh, Whether He saved us or not, He's the only one worthy of all of our life worship. But secondly, He has given us such a salvation that He deserves it in that sense too, right? And so um, let's look at, uh, you know, our only um, pure, acceptable worship is a full life response. And so because it's so central to being a Christian, we're going to look at this. And we're going to do this by looking at three lives. We're going to look at three lives and we're going to dig into what does it mean? What, what, what examples can we see so that we can work out and better understand what worship is? And, and frankly, what worship is not. We're going to see some examples of that. And the very first one that we're going to look at, turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, the woman in the well. Now look, there's a lot of really great stuff in this. Um, we're going to read it, and I'm going to make a couple of observations about worship. Um, and if you're familiar with the story, Jesus has been traveling, he's been doing his ministry, and he shows up at Jacob's well in this one place where the Samaritans, in the land of the Samaritans, and the Samaritans and the Jews have this history that separates them culturally, uh, separates them in their worship practices. They're separate. And let's just let's just read this, and um, I'll I'll, uh, I'll give just a little bit of commentary as we go. Uh, let's just start actually in verse um, four. Uh, I'm sorry, verse seven. So there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. (laughs) For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore, the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you being a Jew ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So Jesus meets this woman who doesn't know about salvation. She doesn't have the understanding, the knowledge, and he wants to share this with her. So he uses this drink thing as an evangelistic opportunity. And she's her interest is peaked right off the bat because in her experience and the very full cultural knowledge of this whole thing, this Jew should not be talking to a Samaritan, not to mention a woman Samaritan. And, she, and he looks like a teacher and a rabbi. You know, it's interesting, even in the early, uh, like around 60 AD, there's documents with like, rabbinic um, rules that say if you touch anything that a, that a Samaritan woman touches, you're unclean ceremonially. And so ra- ra- rabbis, Jewish rabbis would rather go thirsty than that, right? So he's talking to a woman. 
he's talking to a Samaritan woman. And she's like, how is it that you can even ask me for a drink? All right, so Jesus wants to teach her about salvation and what true worship is, and we see that here in the next, in the next verses here. So Jesus answered her and said, actually, if, if, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And she said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. So then where do you go to get that living water? Right? So at first she goes literal. All right. You were asking me for a drink a moment ago, you know, and, and because you can't get water. And now you're saying that I should have asked you for water. This doesn't make any sense. So let me, let me go a little bit further. This, this must have meant something more. So she says next, you're not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? This, this well was known, in fact, in fact, it still is known as being one of the deepest wells in that territory. So it's a big well. If a great man like Jacob can get us something that would, that would give us water for our families in this arid environment, it's, it's, uh, it's also for our, our, our uh, animals. Like, Jacob sustained us for a long, long time. How could you be greater than him? Um, I think there's also maybe some cultural jabs going on here. They have the, Jacob is a common ancestor, but she also knows that Jacob became the father of the Jewish people, Israel. And so there's starting some, some t- tensions here. So we keep going. She said to him, um, you have nothing to draw with. The well is deep. Where do you get that living water? You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you? Who gave us this well and drank of it himself and his cattle? All right, verse 13. Jesus answered and said, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But everyone who drinks of the water I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I give him will become a spring of a spring in him, a well of water springing up to eternal life. And this woman said, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to draw. So she seems willing. And so, uh, you know, Jesus goes at it. He thought, all right, I, I get to basically talk to her about salvation now. And what he does is he draws the spotlight onto her in a way that makes her uncomfortable. Listen to this. So he said to her, verse 16, go, call your husband and come here. And the woman answered, I have no husband. Um, And then Jesus answered to her, you've answered correctly. Uh, You've correctly said, I have no husband. You've had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said, Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. She's, she's a sharp cookie. <laughs> and then she very quickly dodges the question. Listen to this. The very next thing she says, I perceive you're a prophet. Let me ask you a question. <laughs> Verse 20. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem the place where men, uh, is the place where men ought to worship. Uh, do you see what this is? This is a uh, this is the well worn path. This is the argument that has swallowed thousands and thousands of debating hours between Jews and Samarit- and Samaritans. And so she's like, "Whoa, he's talking about my personal life, all the sordid details of things that I don't really want to talk about." So, sir, let me give you the most controversial thing that can chew up our conversation for the next few hours. That's kind of what she's doing here. Maybe there was a genuine curiosity about this man. If you're a prophet and you know all these things, maybe you can answer this question. But I think she kind of knows this is just a stalemate between Samaritans and Jews. And so she says this, and Jesus answers this way. Jesus said to her, verse 21, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither this mount, uh, in, uh, where, when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be His worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming, He who is called Christ. When that one comes, He will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. 
You know, it's interesting. She believes him because she runs off to tell people, you need to listen to this guy. But in summary, the, it's interesting that the, um, she seems so willing to ask about this water and, and Jesus still wants to go after it. And the first thing he does is he points the spotlight on her life, evidence that she's been living for herself in worldly ways um, and not to glorify God with her life. And this was uncomfortable to her. She deflected and pointed to what she thought might be a different profitable conversation. And it's interesting that she wanted to talk about what action she could do. When she wanted to deflect about being a worshiper, oh, we, we worship. We just kind of differ in how we do it. Let's talk about the things that I can do to be a worshiper. And God's like, hmm, that's interesting. Jesus says, no, actually that's not what defines a worshiper. What, what, what defines a worshiper is not where you go to worship. What has he already pointed to? He's pointed to her life, right? Does that sound familiar? Sounds a little bit like Romans 12 when, when, it says, when, when Paul says, look, if you've responded to the, to the gospel, here's what, here's what you instantly have a response that, that you should be exhorted to be at. You should be sacrificing your life to live for that. To live for the one who gives life. And so here, um, he points out two things. Um, he says in verse 23, but an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people the Father seeks to be His worshipers. Can I just point out, God is seeking worshipers. God is seeking people to be true worshipers. There are a lot of false worshipers. So He defines it. That they worship in spirit and in truth. Worship in spirit. This is in fellowship with God. He says God is spirit. You know, um, in all the times that people have come in contact with God and they were able to see Him and interact with Him, um, there's been pure terror because we know that we're sinners. And so how, how does one fellowship spirit to spirit with God unless they're made right? Unless they're made righteous before Him? In genuine spirit to spirit worship this is not faked this is from the heart it's not outward only spirit refers to the human spirit the inner person so um authentic worship worship comes from the heart and this is what he's saying you need to be right and there's only one way through that and the very next thing he says is in the truth how, how do we worship according to truth this is according to the truth god has given about him about his son and about what honors him this is whole life worship he's talking about. Again, Jesus is saying it this time. To worship in spirit and truth, you must first give yourself to a life where you can be right with God. To know what's right with God, you've got to know His truth. And he is pointing out here that the time is coming where that's the only form of worship that's really going to matter and is already here. Why? Because Jesus is here. You know, Jesus is the one that said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so there's a few things that we learn here. This woman did not have salvation, right? She thought worship was a place that you went. She thought it was a, the thing that you do. Her life demonstrated that she did not live in a life given to honor to, to God, right? Her life demonstrated that she was giving honor to herself, but she did acts of worship for God. She would have to become a true worshiper. She would have to change her idea of what worship is and understand the message of salvation that Jesus was offering her. And if she believed it, she would want to give her whole self. She would want to have the right response to the gospel that Josh Kelso talked about last time, right? She would want to give her whole life as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to Him through Jesus. She would become a believer and a true worshiper of God. And you, got, you know what? It, reading the passages that follow, she and many, many Samaritans come to believe in Jesus. He says you have to worship in spirit and truth. You have to be genuine before the Lord and made right with Him. He had shared that with her. They, she actually brought a bunch of people and He kept teaching and they come to know Him. But I, I find it interesting, one of the things that we learned, one of the key lessons and observations is this. Guys, it's not 
Isolated acts of worship does not make anyone a worshiper of God. For example, going to the mountain to worship. Going to church here does not make you a worshiper. Actually, uh, singing songs don't make you a worshiper. They don't make you a worshiper. Reading your Bible alone can't make you a worshiper, right? Those are isolated acts of worship. And that, that, that's not what makes us a worshiper of God. Unsaved people uh, like this woman who doesn't know Jesus needs the gospel and needs to surrender her life. And then those acts of worship are things she can do in spirit and in truth. But without that, that doesn't make her a worshiper. And that's what Jesus was putting a finger on. Your whole life is in discord. But this isolated act of worship won't make you a worshiper. Uh, let, me, let me just make a few other observations. Um, you know, one of the things that we see here is that unsaved people with messy and broken lives can become true worshipers by responding to God. Um, responding to the Gospel in the right way. By the way, it's, it's one, one more observation I'll just make here. It, is it interesting that we learn that it's uncomfortable? The Gospel shows us that our lives have been lived in ways we don't probably, we're probably not proud of. And we like to deflect that. We don't like to point that out. But God wants to cover that. He wants to forgive that. And He wants you to commit your whole life to that, to Him. Um, let, me, let me give you one more example here. Here's some of the, um, the Father seeking true worshipers. Uh, sorry, Jacob. Um, I was just going to review those real quick. Um, isolated acts of worship don't make us worshipers of God and unsaved people with broken, messy, sinful lives can become true worshipers by receiving the message, salvation of Jesus Christ. When we put these together, you'll see in a moment how these start to, to knit. Just turn to Psalm 51 real quick. I'm going to give a quick summary of this. We're going to look at the life of David just briefly for just another observation about true worship. Psalm 51 was written by David, and I'll just give you the quick background if you're not familiar with it. It was written by David about a, a terrible time in his life. He is the king of Israel back in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. We, we read the historical account of this man after God's own heart who is the very king of Israel and demonstrated worship for his whole life. He is a whole life worshiper. And you know what he did? He sinned. He covets another man's wife. He commits adultery with her. He gets her pregnant. He kills her husband and tries to, carry, to cover it up. Like, how more of a life could you have that is contrary to what God has said is godly, is worshipful, right? And the Lord reveals His sin to Nathan who confronts him. And unlike the woman at the well, he already knows God. He knows Him well. And up till this point, Lived a life committed to God. He was tempted. He stumbled and he sinned. And he withheld a part of his life from God. So it was no longer whole life worship. This is an important thing for us to learn. There are many of you in this room that have trusted Christ. Some maybe haven't. Some maybe haven't wanted your whole life to be under Him. Maybe it's been a life you want to kind of keep for yourself and then do some acts of worship for. But we just learned that. That doesn't work. The woman of the well had to look differently at that. And here's a man who is a Christian uh, in our current New Testament terminology. He is a believer. He is made righteous by faith in God. And he stumbles, and now he is looking at his life. There's a whole portion of his life that is no longer lived for God. It's lived for himself in his own desires, and he's caught in it. This psalm was written by David about this terrible rebellion against God, and he confesses his sin, the summary of this whole thing. He acknowledges um, that he withheld part of his life from God. He rebelled against it. He asked God for forgiveness. He asked him to restore his relationship with him. Listen to what David knows to be true about his worship in this season of life when David was not living his life in, in worship. Look at verse 16. I'll just jump straight to it. He says, for you do not delight in sacrifice, 
Otherwise, I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. (laughs) Those are acts of worship, guys. In fact, those are appropriate acts of worship for somebody who sinned. Why would David say this? Why would David say these acts of worship are not pleasing to God when they're things that he commanded him to do? And there's a whole lot more examples in this. And the answer is this. Here's the the quick answer. Because the only proper response to God's salvation is to give your whole life to God and worship everything. Not a part. Not an act of worship. Acts of worship that are contrary to the rest of your life. (laughs) Um, That that doesn't honor the Lord. That's not worship. Um, Look at, uh, David continues to explain what true worship looks like. Look at verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do you recognize that theme from Romans 12? A whole life of sacrificial worship to God for His own glory. A humble spirit before God. A humble and earnest heart offered to God. This is worshiping in spirit. That's what Jesus was talking about. He's saying, I'm, there's this broken relationship. I don't have my whole life given to you, and that's really what you want. You want me to have that kind of life so that when I sacrifice, when I sing, when I go to the temple, when I do the things that I do, they're actually honoring to you rather than contradictory to who I really am. And, and so that's why I'm not at the temple right now giving burnt offerings. I need to pray. I need to confess. I need to ask for forgiveness. I need to make sure that my life is one of repentance. Um, Verse 6, by the way, just to jump back. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the innermost, in the hidden part, you will make me know wisdom. This is David worshiping in truth. He knows God's law and instruction. He knows what honors him. David knows God's desire to walk, for him to walk in truth in his innermost being. He's not walking in ignorance about what God wants. He's not walking in deceitfulness, hiding the fact that he was opposing God's law. He actually confesses it. That is worship, guys. It's obedience to God. And here's King David who fell. And he wants to be a worshiper of God. You know, if you keep reading, um, he says, uh, verse 10, this whole psalm is full of <laughs> live, whole life, living sacrifice, true worship, spirit, and truth. He, look at verse 10. He says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't cast me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. A steadfast spirit, this is a whole life. Like, not partial, not off and on. Steadfast. I want to walk rightly with you so that my spirit can be right before your spirit. (laughs) So your spirit dwells in me, not has to resist and I have to resist Him. That's whole, that's whole life worship. Sustain me with a willing spirit, he says in verse 12. Constant whole life sacrifice. Look, David's sin was so obvious and evident, he confesses that he had to resist God to get where he was. He confesses he was not worshiping God and has not been worshiping God. He worshiped his own desires. And, and here's what we learn from this. Acts of worship sacrifices, for example, are not acceptable to God from people who, are, who choose to not live their life for God. This should, this should cause us pause, people. So some key lessons and observations is just that no acts of worship or pleasing are acceptable to God without first offering their life in full life sacrifice. If you sing a song and it really feels good, but your whole life is out of discord with what honors the Lord, that song is not honoring to the Lord. It's not honoring to the Lord. I, I won't tell you the whole background, but the book of Isaiah, he's a prophet saying, wake up, Israel. Wake up. And one of the things that he says there, he's, he says, go tell them, Uh, Go tell the people, Isaiah, what are your multiplied sacrifices to me? I've had enough of burnt offerings from rams and the fat of the cattle. I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs or goats, the sacrifices. When you come to appear before me, who requires you 
trampling my courts. Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of the assemblies, I can't endure your iniquity and the solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. So when you spread your hands out in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply your prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourself clean. Remove the evil deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil. Um, it's interesting. Doing the things that are supposed to be worshipful to God when you've got a life like that is an offense to Him. And it's something that we need to take seriously if we call ourselves Christians. So, you know what? No acts of worship are pleasing until that. Um, the other thing that we can learn from David is that believers who stumble into sin and withhold an area of their life from God, they, they have broken fellowship with God. But God is gracious to restore believers who repent from sin and offer their whole life in worship to restore the joy of, their, of, of God's salvation. I just want you to know that that example was given to us so that if you are a person who says, I'm a Christian, I follow Christ, but I'm looking at my life and it looks epically not obedient to God. <laughs> David can understand that. And this, this psalm is such a great example. It's su such a great example. So as we close, I want you to consider one more life. One more life. This last life, I, I can't turn to Scripture. I I'd, I'd like you to consider yours. I'd like you to consider your life. Are you a true worshiper of God? Maybe the first question I could ask you is, what was your response to the Gospel? If you've heard the Gospel, and we were talking last week about there's really only one genuinely good response to the Gospel, and that is to just go, oh, wow. I'm going to give my whole life to the Lord in an obedient sacrifice. I'm going to sacrifice my desires, my wants, my aspirations for life and say, Lord, I want to honor you with mine. It's not an easy thing to do, but it's the only right response to the gospel. So a person must first be submitted to God by believing the gospel and being a follower of him. Without that, you know, the Holy Spirit can't indwell us and can't even uh, engage in, in worship spirit to spirit. Secondly, let's be clear, no acts of worship can save you. No acts of worship can earn your merit before God. No sacrifices, no reading enough of your Bible, no praying enough. No going to church enough, no singing the right songs, no arguing the right doctrinal things. Guys, these are the things I thought saved me when I was about some of your age. I could argue a lot of things in the Bible. I didn't know Jesus. I was not saved. <laughs> I worshipped my own intellect. I worshipped my own comfort. I worshipped my own ego stroking. <laughs> but I didn't know Jesus. Those acts of worship of going to church and singing the songs and doing my devotions and doing all those things, going to the right church. I thought I went to the only right church at that age. Guys, worshiping on that mountain or that mountain isn't what saves you. Christ died on the cross and paid for all of the sin that you have ever seen or not seen. That anything that you've ever done, are doing, will ever do. He paid every cent of it so that there's no judgment left for you for all who believe and trust in that and become true worshipers. Christ will make them right and the Holy Spirit will indwell you. This is what saves you. No act of worship can, can earn you merit before God. If you're a believer and you desire to follow Christ, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God that He offers through the Gospel, to sacrifice yourself and your desires and your aspirations for this world and give your whole life to God. Check yourself. Did I offer up isolated acts of worship? Do I come and I sing the song and at the same time maybe hate my brother that's sitting next to me? 
Do we read our Bibles and take our notes and then walk out the door and I get really angry with my parents because they just want to stick around and fellowship while I've got other things to do with my life and I'm angry? <laughs> I'm, I'm describing me, so if, it's, if it happens to be pricking any of you guys, I'm so sorry, but this is, this is if that's you, repent. Like David, wow, my life really doesn't align with this. I'm not worshiping anyone but myself. But God is so good and He is so worthy of worship so that when you come to do these acts of worship, they're an extension of what you've been doing all week long. And you know who's going to help you with that? The Holy Spirit will help you. The Word of God will help you as He works through that. The fellowship with the people here will help you with that. Your pastors and elders, they're going to be helping you with that. And that's what the whole life of Christians is about. And that puts things like singing in perspective. It becomes just an extension of what you've been doing. So help each other with that. Ask yourself these questions, these probing questions. Be encouraged by what the Lord has for you and His goodness that He has for you and the gospel and how amazing it is. And stir each other up in it so that you can be a true worshiper in spirit and truth. One that's not just waiting on your acts to earn some merit, but your life is just humbly submitted to Him. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for all the things You teach us so that we can know what worship is. I thank You that we can um, be in fellowship with people who also want to pursue You. I thank You that You have such grace and patience for anybody who has whole sections of their life that maybe doesn't accord with Your Word. And You have Your Spirit and Your Word working in our lives, taking root, that we would know what is right and what is wrong. Lord, would You give each of these students a desire to know what it's like to have no barrier between You and their, their spirit and Your spirit? Would You give them a desire to align their lives in obedience to You such that they would submit to Your Word, to the other authorities that, that You've put in their life to show them these things, like their parents? that they would have joy, and that you would, if anybody is contrary to that right now, Lord, I pray that as they repent, that they would repent, and that they would be restored to the joy of your salvation. And Lord, if anybody here doesn't know that joy yet, I pray that the opportunity for this, even tonight, would be so great that they would take it, and they would ask for the encouragement that it, they need to continue to walk in it as a worshiper who sacrificed their whole life to you. Thank you for these examples in Scripture. Give us encouraging discussion as we go forward now. In Jesus' name, amen.